Claventure, this is a uh, talk about Lando. Administer your own cloud city, I called it. Uh, you'll forgive the Star Wars geekery throughout, or maybe you'll just enjoy it. Um, so I'm a partner at Consensus Enterprises. We do lots of um, Drupal development, backend DevOpsy kind of stuff. And uh, Lando's sort of of late been our preferred local development tool. Um, so I thought I'd just sort of give you a bit of the story of how I got into it, kind of what I particularly like about it. If you're here, I'm guessing you're aware that there are a bunch of these tools floating about. Um, yeah, just kind of get into some of the details. So a uh, quick overview. Um, I'm going to share with you some of my assumptions and the stuff that I'm not going to go into detail about. Um, I'm going to cover some Lando basics and sort of show you uh, this idea that really it's just kind of a convenience wrapper over top of Docker Compose, right? Um, so we'll look at that a little bit. Then some customization stuff that they've got built in. How do I do a little more advanced stuff? And then a little bit of the workflow. So some of the, some of the interesting pieces we've been working out about how do we work with this thing? How does it integrate with pushing up to, to production? Stuff like that. And uh, in spite of my, I don't want to talk about some things, please, please feel free to ask questions. And I mean, I, just because of time, right? I, I could talk in detail about one particular thing, but I want to, I want to get into some of the details. So, um, so I'm assuming a little bit of Docker, Docker Compose, at least kind of a familiarity with the idea of containers and stuff like that. Uh, you know, get Drupal workflow, an idea of what Composer's doing for us. Like, I'm hoping that you folks are mostly sort of developers or, as I say, have some familiarity with that kind of workflow, right? Um, especially if you're familiar with Node.js at all, or you like that kind of thing, um, I wanted to recommend installing Lando from source. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to install. They have like packages for all the different operating systems and stuff. It's really easy. Um, I started doing this because they were having releases really quickly. Like every couple of weeks, there'd be a new one and I was finding it a pain in the butt to go off and find the new .deb package and download it and so on. Uh, when I cloned their Git repo, it was a matter of just fetching and checking out the, the new tag or whatever, and then you run a couple of node commands and you're up and running on the new version. Um, but it's actually become really handy. Uh, I'm not really a node guy, but I've managed to sort of dig into the code a little bit. Having a copy of it on my machine that it's running from is a helpful thing to see what the heck is this recipe actually doing. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit of that as we go along as well. Okay, that's the install from source link. So feels sort of obligatory to at least mention some of the other tools out there, right? Um, there's, a, there's a whole host of them. The venerable Drupal VM, which maybe some of you have, you have used over the years, right? It's Vagrant based, but uh, Jeff Geerling is actually doing a bunch of work lately. There's sort of uh, early support for Docker built into Drupal VM. Um, and that's kind of a cool use case if you're, I don't know why you would do this, if you're a Windows developer. Sorry, I'm a Linux guy. If you're on Windows, go for it. Run Drupal VM do the Lando stuff inside of that, right? Then you have all of the power of all of these things. Um, also, Jeff's done tons of work building out like Ansible roles and doing cool stuff with that, right? Like it's, it's, a, it's a good body of work. There's other things, DDEV, Docsol, you know, there's a variety of them that are doing similar stuff to this, right? Using Docker as the underlying thing and then building kind of a framework on top of that to make it a little easier to manage Drupal sites. In the case of Lando, one of the things I really like is that it's really agnostic. It doesn't, they started from a Drupal perspective, but like you want to do WordPress, go for it. You want to do Node.js, go for it. You can, it's, it's really kind of agnostic at that level, which some of these other ones are as well. And um, as I was putting this talk together, right, like I started thinking, well, I'll just talk about Lando because it's what I know best. And I started looking into the other ones and I, I started to realize like there's a, there's a, a kind of convergence happening in the community, right? There's a, there's a set of best practices around using Drupal for this stuff starting to emerge, um, and that's really cool. So to this extent, it's kind of personal preference, but it also starts to feel like we're getting to the point where we could um, start to abstract and, and focus our efforts on some of these best practice things. And maybe there's some underlying tools that all of these guys could use that, that sort of set the, set the groundwork, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> um, one of the things I ran across as I was as I was getting this, this is just very recent. Um, Mo Schweitzman uh, published a, a blog post about how they ended up using Docker for the uh, Massachusetts <laughs> Massachusetts government website. Um, the team there had some familiarity with Docker, and they ended up deciding they 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 he, you know he he takes some trouble to mention some of these other ones that I just showed you. 
And he says, well, for us, it made more sense to just go kind of vanilla, just build our own thing on top of Docker Compose. And again, this put, to me sort of points to this idea that we're, we're starting to figure out like, okay, how is this tool really useful and what are the kind of common things that we want to be able to do with it, right? Um, so that's a link to the post. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting read. It's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a cool idea, I think. So um, good luck to them with that and you if you want to follow that approach or, or whatever, right? I say, like I say. Quick shout out, um, the other neat project I ran across recently that's, um, that's again, kind of extending this idea of what Lando's doing is the Amazy folks um, have this thing called Lagoon, right? And they, they've taken this idea of Lando as local development, but sort of set it up in such a way that what you're running locally is literally what you could deploy into your Kubernetes cluster, right? So you're, now you're, the difference between your site running on your laptop and the site running in production is almost nothing. Right, you have the same container images. Is it still Lando, or it's no. not Lando? It's it's their own thing. It's their own thing. Yeah, it's yeah. Sort of a Lando, sort of a but it's again, it's like the local thing is built on sort of wrapping around Docker yes. Compose, and sure. this is what I'm saying, and right? These same ideas are emerging sort of across thing, the board. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I'm I'm really excited about this. I haven't had as much chance as I'd like to to dig into it, but I think it's like I say, it's sort of where we should be heading, right? Um, so that's their site. <laughs> uh, okay, so some basics, right? <clears throat> you get Lando installed, um, you wanna start a brand new site. So this is all, top half of this slide is, is really standard, right? You make yourself a directory, you run this composer create project stuff, now you have a Drupal code base, <clears throat> you throw it in Git, okay? I've taken the liberty of doing all that stuff for you just to avoid composer slowdown. I had most of the packages cached, but last time I ran it was a little bit slow. Then you do this Lando thing. And I've expanded here. If you don't provide these, these um, options, it just asks them for you on the, on the command line. So you can literally just say Lando and net, right? And I've done that up to that point already. So here I'm gonna paste in my Lando and net. Sorry, I should have cleared that screen for you. <clears throat> and it, it goes off and figures out from this recipe kind of what the, what the setup I want for this site, right? And that um, then creates me, let me, let me do these steps first. Then I throw that lando.yaml file, the config that it's created into Git for myself so I can keep track of it, and I run a Lando start, right? And that's gonna take that Lando YAML config file that I, that I created, spin up the relevant containers that I need, and do a little trick with this proxy uh, container called Traffic, which a bunch of these other tools are using as well. It just kind of sits in front, catches the fancy name that they have so that this chewy.lando.site redirects through traffic and into my, um, my containers. Sorry, here. So there's my site. Now I can start installing. Now one minor hitch that uh, might catch you the first time you do this, the, um, the database, because we're in Docker, right? I think this is Drupal 7, Drupal 7. These are all just default uh, credentials that Lando sets up for you. Um, <clears throat> usually your MySQL database is local. In this case, it's, it's not local. It's in a separate database service container, right? So I call it database. That's how it finds it. So I can say save and continue. Oh, I missed something. Maybe this was just Drupal. Oops, other one too. Oh, you're right. Good call. Thanks. Drupal 8. There we go. So now it's off and running, right? <coughs> So, that Lando YAML config file, that's it. That's the whole thing. And, you know, that sort of convention, it's relying on these ideas of recipes, right? So because I said this is a Drupal 8 site, yet it makes a whole bunch of assumptions built in that's taken from this recipe Drupal 8 line, and it assumes a whole bunch of other configuration about the Docker Compose file that I want to generate, right? So when I'm saying Lando start, first thing it does is look at this and then create a new Docker Compose file for me 
to use that to spin up the containers that I want, right? So um, that file lives in here, or usually what I, I haven't followed exactly how this logic works. There's usually a few of these after you've been running it for a little while. You got to look at the the one with the most recent timestamp if you really care about seeing the, the latest and greatest one. Uh, it's not necessarily by the numbers. I'm not clear exactly what they're doing there, but that file is 127 lines long. And like complicated, you know, Docker Compose is cool and like easy to get into, but at that level, like all of the stuff that's built in there, you don't want to maintain that by hand, right? Um, so that's the simple case. So I look at this, I, I read the, the initial docs and I'm like, great, but most of the time I'm not actually starting from a pristine Drupal site, <laughs> right? I mean, these days I am, because nowadays I start a project and I know I want Lando right away, and so I start from that basis, but more often than not, I'm inheriting a site or it's something that's been in production for years and I want to bring it into the Lando framework, right? Well, it's basically the same thing. So this is, this is the set of commands I run, right? This is my, uh, my father-in-law's Drupal 7 website that he wants me to help him with, with upgrading or whatever, right? So I went off and um, grabbed a copy of that, which I have here. And, uh, you know, that's his Drupal 7 code base. I just pulled it off of uh, NetFirms or wherever it lived. I grabbed a database dump over here, right? And now I'm going to do this. I say Lando init. Right, great. Now you have a Lando YAML file. It's going to look like this down here. I start it up. Same thing as before, right? Say it again? Yeah. Yeah. So this will take a minute to spin up, but yeah, then I'm going to run this, this db import command. It's going to grab my database dump, suck it into the containers the, the proper way, and you'll see. I should put the link there, but I'll, I'll be able to flip to a, a tab and have that site up and running. It's going to look pretty much like the, the other one. And I first time I did this, I thought, uh, it's probably going to take me an hour to work this out, right? Like literally 10 minutes. <laughs> and the hard part was getting the copy of the site on my laptop, <laughs> right? <laughs> I had to like figure out how to log in to his thing and okay, how do I access NetFirm's file download? Oh, I can SFTP, yada, yada, right? This part's trivial. Right, so there, now I have smithwriter.lando.site. Incidentally, this is a uh, this is a convention that they've they've registered this top level domain or this 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 Lando .site domain to just point to localhost. There you go. Right there's my local copy of Doug's site. Um, so that that's what traffic is doing essentially is just um, it, intercepting the the DNS localhost picks up the name sends you to the right set of containers right. <clears throat> it gets better. So remember I was talking about the recipes, right? So uh, the, the recipes live in this subdirectory. This is my, again, this is my source, uh, my source clone of the, of the Lando stuff. It's harder to find this. I think it's still possible if you install it from a dev package or whatever, right? So I just found it super handy if I'm like, what is this recipe actually doing for me? Well, I can go into this JavaScript file and it's just a bunch of functions, the meat of which is this build function, right? Which is where the assumptions are baked in, right? They say, well, probably you're gonna want Apache unless you said something else, right? Probably you're gonna want PHP 7 unless you said something else. Let's grab Drush for you, right? Set that up and so on. And you, you might've noticed when I did the, the Drupal 8 one, same idea. It um, it pulled in Drush into the into the containers for me, kind of automatically. Um, so now I have access to Drush commands inside my containers, which is just handy, right? And and there's lots of good capacity to to add in more things yourself. I get, I'll get to those later. Um, but this is you know I haven't actually needed to do this, but it's like to, to customize this. But it's nice to know if I want to write my own recipe, 
It's a matter of implementing this kind of a file, right? And it, if you look at the Drupal 8 one of these, there's a comment at the top of the file that says, uh, let's just cheat and pull in the Drupal 7 stuff, <laughs> right? And they import this file, and then there's a little bit more code that's Drupal 8 specific, right? Um, so maybe you wanted to customize a little bit beyond Drupal 8. You have, a, you have a basic Drupal 8 thing, but then you pull in some custom modules or something like that. You could, you could do that at this level, right? Or maybe there are some libraries that you want natively or that kind of thing. In many, most cases that I've found so far, there are other good ways to go, to go about this, but it, you know, it's cool to know this is available. And yeah, so like as opposed to the post, like the post install, right? the post install, or like is there any pros or cons of putting it in the recipe versus the post install? Um, I mean, I guess it would, like if you're using the recipe a lot, right, it's handy to, to wrap it in here, here then the and then any new site you spin up, you just go dash dash recipe, blah, and it makes those assumptions for you, right? You don't have to explicitly add them into your Lando YAML config, right? Um, yeah. Anyway. So, good times. Um, and like I said earlier, right? Anybody, anybody know Grav CMS? It's a, a new-ish PHP CMS that's just based in uh, flat files. Um, so it's kind of cool. You can edit all this stuff. Uh, just like markdown or whatever. Um, so this one is a is an instance of like a custom thing, right? Something there's no recipe for per se, um, <clears throat> but I wanna I wanna spin something up on it, right? So here's my uh, grab has this idea of skeletons, which is kind of like a almost like a distribution, sort of a pre wrapped set of functionality. I just grabbed one of those for the sake of of uh, demo because it's. It, it spins up a relatively complete site out of the box. So I'll show you how that works. So um, there's my grab skeleton zip file that I downloaded. I unpack it. I'm just going to do this move. Let's go like this one. And again, land on it. All right, my recipe is custom. I'll give it a name and a web root. Same idea. Sorry, I missed. Did you actually make a custom, or you just when you type in custom, that just, just Cu custom is a recipe that sort of makes minimal assumptions. Yeah, and so you'll see right now if I show you the Lando YAML, it spit out there. It's, it's mostly like it was before, but it just says custom instead, and like I say, that kind of means make very very few assumptions. So then. Uh, what I need to do in this case is I need to sort of tell it a little bit more about what I need uh, to run this custom thing. Oops. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So basically, I'm I want to I want to name the the site so the proxy does the right thing. I don't want to tell it. You know, I want I want latest and greatest PHP. It's going to use Apache. Turn on SSL for me. Right. SSL certs are uh, self-signed by Lando, so you get this mess, but. Whatever. There's my graph site, right? So what was that like? 15 minutes. I just spun up three new sites. So customizing, right? I want to do slightly more advanced stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff. And this is the other thing that I that I um I should say that I'm I'm really pleased with Lando about the documentation site is excellent. They really put quite a lot of effort into it to, you know, talk about basics, how to install, you know, there's details about all these different recipes. If you go to one of these and and scan down, this Drupal 8 one is probably the most elaborate, but it gives you a fair bit of detail about how to use that particular recipe. How do I customize it to do stuff that's common within that, right? Um, Similarly, you know, stuff about the different services, stuff about running it on the command line, right? Then there's sort of 
uh, troubleshooting stuff, known issues, there's some like advanced workflow stuff and so on. So the docs are really quite excellent. <clears throat> so that being said, uh, say I want Nginx instead of Apache. That's, that's the change. Then I, then I run Lando Restart and I'm running on Nginx. Okay. I want Maria instead of MySQL by default, same thing. Right? Um, in the case, you, you probably want to decide this up front, like maybe don't change your database after you've got it going, but if you really want to, you can do that. Um, yeah, so it's nice at this level, right? Obvious customizations are exposed at the config level, so changing it out is as simple as one line in the, in the config level, right? <clears throat> Similarly, I want to add mail, mail hog. This is what Lando calls services, right? I want extra containers doing specific things. Um, Mailhog's a nice one if you're running a development site, it catches all the email, right? So if you're doing a workflow testing a user registration process, it makes it super easy to flip back and forth between tabs, get the, get the registration email link, go back to your development tab, log in with it, right? Run through that really quickly. So I add that. Let's go back to my Chewy site here. Yeah. <clears throat> App server is the is the conventional default that Lando calls your your web server container, uh, and like everything else, you can you can override that, but that's the the sort of standard one. Um, Oh, actually, I might need to do a. Well, let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. See, so creating so it created a new container for me for the Mailhog service. <clears throat> and once that finishes, it should show me that list of URLs, and you'll see there's an extra in, one in there. It's going to be called mh.chewy or something like that. There's Drush. Oh, I think I forgot the proxy. Well, I want to. I want to keep moving, but you get the idea, right? I would get a. I I, I missed a, a proxy config line in that Yando, Lando YAML that would that would expose another one of these URLs for me. Um, I'll, I can show you an example of that as we go along later. Um, you know, or whatever. Elasticsearch, MongoDB, npm, whatever. And again, the the docs are great on this. Um, tons of detail about all of the ones that are available, as well as some, some, some stuff about how to add your own if you, if, if, you know, what you want is not in this list, right? So what if I want custom configuration, right? I need specific parameters in my PHP INI. Well, I go into my services area. This is again this land o YAML config. I say within the app server, I want to I want to override some config. This PHP INI grab from my local repository, and then I create this PHP INI file. I can what I typically do is I go and grab the default one from the recipe, copy it in, and and adjust it as I need. Or if I know I need something specific from production or whatever, I drop it in there. Right. Similarly, those database credentials I showed you earlier were uh, as insecure as they might get, so I might want to override those. So, more exciting stuff. We were working on a project that uh, was a single sign-on system, right? So, uh, we needed authentication you know, showing the whole registration process from the user, user registers an account, they get a credential, the OAuth scenario, right? Well, now I technically need two sites to be able to, to sort of play with and go back and forth between, right? I need a registration authority on the one hand, the like OAuth provider or whatever, and I need like a client site, the relying party that's going to authenticate against that, that authority, right? So I need two sites. Well, okay. This is the start of my Lando YAML. Same basic idea. See a little bit of uh, more detail here. I've turned on Xdebug because that's going to be handy. 
I've pulled in some extra composer or Docker compose stuff that sets up Chrome driver for me so I get nice JavaScript testing. Then in my services area, now I've overridden uh, that app server default that I mentioned, the convention, uh, and called it RA Web and RADB. So my first two containers are the registration authority ones, right? And my second two are the relying party ones. So now I have four different containers I've defined. <coughs> oh. And I had a, uh... sorry, where's my, mail hug down here at the end, right? And now I just say, I want you to hog mail from both of those web servers. Uh, sorry, I forgot to fix those. Those should be RA web and RP web. Uh, one of the things I noticed when we were doing this, uh, we, we spent a while troubleshooting a problem where we weren't over explicitly overriding the, the default, the app server one. And we noticed that the, the default app server container was behaving differently than the secondary one. I think it was the RP in that case. Um, dug into it a bunch and discovered that Lando sort of treats the app server a little bit special. Um, so the fix for that was basically just name them explicitly and then they're all treated the same way. And basically that's sort of the, the, the trend. Anytime you want to be sure about something, be explicit about it in, in the config, right? <clears throat> So that worked out really great. Like, you know, same, same thing I've been showing you, just spins up a few more containers and now I have two different sites I can work on and bounce back and forth between them, right? So a little bit of workflow stuff. Um, Drumkit is a project Christopher started. It's basically a collection of make files. Uh, and it, uh, it comes to mind because a few of those other blog posts I've been reading and, and tools and stuff kind of use make files as a, as a way to sort of package some other, uh, other commands for yourself. Um, and we found this really helpful as just a way to sort of uh, abstract out upstream some of the common things that we do with Drupal sites so we can just pull it in across the board. Um, so uh, he's very humble about this, but it, it's, it's really quite a cool project. Um, it's worth taking a peek at. Um, you might hear, have your own thing, but this is what, what we've been doing. So you set it up like that. There's this uh, handy one-liner, which if you're security conscious, you might cringe at, but uh, if you look into it, that's basically what it's doing. So we'll do that here. <clears throat> and now if I run a make, I have a whole bunch of make targets built in that have some awareness about Drupal and stuff like that. These let me kind of quickly run tests or rebuild the site from scratch and you know I can I can configure it to, sh to, to know which database import I want to pull in or do some of those you know Lando has some facility for this. Like I say this is kind of what we've landed on as, as our way of tackling it um, and it you know it has had some. So like composer install? Exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. And um, I'll show you as we go along, one of the things that's, that it's proven really handy for is it kind of uh, it unifies things in terms of our CI system, right? So the make targets apply on GitLab just as well as they do on my, on my local. And you know, in some cases, we've had to do some CI-specific stuff, but they ultimately end up sort of doing this, the same set of things. So it just becomes a convenient place to package like common tasks I do with this site, right? And just a question then, um, so if you have like a, a CI-specific thing, how do you put that conditional, like are you running the same? the same CI. We've, we've ended up doing like in the make file. Yeah. Um, so what, what, this, uh, what this is basically doing right is adding a sub module for that repo that has the collection of, okay. of make tools um, and then sim links to, or sorry, references it by a project global make file. Right. right? So that file by default just has this one line but if I have project specific stuff I want to do I just add it in add there and then I have new targets available. Right. Um, and but you know, one of the one of the cool things out of the box drum kit can do is um, pulling composer for you. So it's, it's not maybe relevant most of the time, but other packages like that, I can say make composer, and it'll pull it in, set it up for me. Uh, 
can't think of another example off the top, but um, other other things like that, so sort of tools that you that you readily use that you know you don't want to have to remember to go have to go look up the install set of commands every time, right? So it just collects those for you. Ooh, that, say it again. Ah, yes. Right. This is our uh, an example of the GitLab CI YAML, right? So in my uh, in my build phase, I call this make build, right? And that's the same one that I would call on my local to do the same thing on my local, right? <clears throat> I run uh, down here. This is my uh, my actual test run make CI, and this is one of those cases where tests ran a little bit differently on on GitLab because they do weird stuff. Um, so I think locally we would have make test, but it basically just calls by hat in a slightly different way. Right. Um, so yeah, this is the this is the sourcing that Christopher was talking about. It sort of, that would do the credentials thing, so that works in GitLab for us as well. You know, we instead of the local like a home directory creds file, you have the creden the secrets in your GitLab right. project set up right, and then it pulls them from there for you. And debugging stuff. I mentioned earlier uh, xDebug, right? It, it's uh, fairly straightforward to set up. Well, after the first time you do it at least, but the docs again are pretty good. This is a link to, to them. Uh, I won't go into it in, in detail, but uh, but it's it's really nice. Like you can get set up so PHP Storm can just step through your stuff like you're used to, but it's all happening in the container. It's very nice. Um, and then tooling is the other, the other interesting thing here. Um, I haven't showed you yet, but in here I, I told you I can do Lando Drush for example, and that's running in my inside my Docker containers. But if I want to add new ones of those, <clears throat> I can define them in my Lando YAML file. So if there's a, you know, uh, well that Lando DB import was another example of that, right? But I can make up my own. Uh, this is an interesting example from the docs where it's like uh, dynamically, dis you, can, you can specify on the command line which service you want it to run on. So their example is like, I want to know what the environment looks like in my database container and in my app server container, I want to be able to specify when I'm actually typing it. I can go, um, right, I run it like a, a Lando dynamic would be the name of my command and then a dash s to specify a non-default uh, container service for it to run on, right? Um, those kinds of things. It's all good stuff. So that's about it. Thanks for listening. Thanks, uh, Triple North organizers, for uh, for putting it on. Any questions or anything? Yes. Instead of the self-signed certificates, could we stick in let's encrypt certificates? Um, yeah, I haven't followed that closely. It's changed since I first looked at it. They were actually doing that kind of stuff originally. I think it's a little bit tricky because of the way that you have to authorize the certs, right? And um, yeah, I didn't follow it closely, but in theory, that's possible for sure. Yeah, you can also provide your own, right? Like you can override and just yeah. I mean, for local development, it's mostly not worth it, right? You click through, you add that exception one time, and you can carry on. Like. Exactly. Yeah, you would have to add, yeah. Yeah? Uh, you told 
what about the installation from source? So let us imagine that a new version uh, came, or what is the procedure? So you will get pool, and after that, uh, in terms of Lando, so most of the time you can, well, okay, a lot of the time you can get away with just just updating your code base and carry on with your with your Docker containers as they were, right? If something dramatic changes, you might need to do a Lando restart just to sort of kick the containers in the butt and get the new stuff. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, um, sometimes. Uh, usually it happens if you're actually editing something in the Lando YAML, like if you change something, you add a new service or something like that. Sometimes you have to go as far as doing a Lando rebuild, which is a slightly more drastic version. It takes a little bit longer because usually it'll pull in the new service containers that you need and stuff like that. But yeah, that's it. Yes. Although, although I am using Ubuntu, my server is CentOS, I still might put the laptop I normally have, have on a daily basis is Windows. Mm -hmm. Now, you said something about putting your Lando inside Drupal VM. I thought that part of the attraction of Lando was that I could run it. Absolutely. And if you're on Linux, that's absolutely the way I would recommend. Really, the only use case I can think of for Drupal VM and then Lando inside would be if you're on Windows or something where it's a bit more of a pain to just run to Lando directly. So, yeah, so my, my daily driver is a Windows 10. Yeah. And so, so you're, you think that it, that it may be better to run it inside Drupal VM instead of. Again, I'm not a Windows guy. I can't speak to it directly. If you were going to go the Drupal VM, I would start with looking at Jeff's uh, Docker support built into Drupal VM. It's kind of experimental at the moment. He, he says that, but it's probably going to be the easiest thing to start with. But if that doesn't work for you for whatever reason, I would yeah, just install Lando inside your VM and off you go. Yeah. Uh, I think there's like I think there's a native Windows build of Lando as well. So start yeah, there. Start there. There was like a year ago. Yeah. Right, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's still, yeah. Yeah. Does the GPX post like fault on like the same port as HTTP? Or is it? It's exposed internally. So in terms of the networking, it sets up a bridge network for your set of containers and then and then exposes 3306 or whatever you override it to to the to the other services. So you'll have to try to rely on that and once you go on that. The right uh, easiest way to do it is do do uh, Lando, yeah, Lando MySQL or okay, whatever to, to get in there. Like another GUI which doesn't allow you to configure which MySQL to use. Uh, gotcha. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, there is a way to do that. You can you can tell it that you want to expose the database service to your That's to your host. Service MySQL or. Yeah, yeah, and then you could point like a like a local MySQL workbench or something at that port to, to get at it. Yeah. In terms of persisting the database to drive, is that part of the repository? Uh, no. Um, what what uh, Lando does is create volumes for the for that stuff, and it persists the database stuff on a volume for you. So unless you do a Lando destroy my app, that that volume will, will persist for you. So uh, which is sometimes helpful. I think that's what a Lando rebuild does differently. Is it actually destroys the containers and restarts them for you? So if you need to fully start from scratch, get a, a fresh database dump in or whatever, that's the way to go. Does that then the user folder? I um, can't remember off the top where it puts those volumes. I think it's somewhere in that like tilde slash dot, dot Lando yeah, yeah. it sets them up for you. Yeah. yeah. Good. Anything else? Just, uh, I mean, it's kind of silly, but uh, running, can you run multiple, you know, if you're running multiple projects at once, uh, if you spin this up twice, you're going to like eat up two gigs of memory for a Lando container or whatever. They're both like, they're kind of heavy. like. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I've, I've definitely found running more than a couple at a time starts to slow things down. Um, I mean, you should just shut it. If you're not working on like, yeah, projects simultaneously. Yeah, like, yeah. and there's a, there's a nice shortcut. You can do Lando power off within a project, and it will just shut the containers down for that one. Right. Um, so it's pretty easy to spin them up and down as you need like that. Uh, one, one gotcha I noticed about... Um, Running like if you it, you want to check a, a feature branch of a, this same project you have somewhere else, 
if you clone it under the same directory name and you do a Lando init and you don't explicitly say what name you want to call it, it will try to call it the same as your default one or right. whatever. Uh, and then you end up with two with the same name and things go astray. So I've just taken to explicitly specifying the name each time. And, uh, okay. So the, the top name of the Lando file? Like, yeah, like when you do that Lando init. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was mostly coming up because we, we were committing the Lando YAML config into the repo yeah. and pushing it up, right? So then you clone it down, you check out your branch, but the name in the, in the Lando config is still the same. Still the same. <laughs> so if you don't change it, thing, things get confused. Yeah, so I ran into an issue where we were just booting up, it was strange, because I have three machines and Lando was working great on two of them. They're all Mac, same OS, and then I'm just getting the red, when you're finished spinning it up, you get green for the working aliases, and it's mm -hmm. red on two of them. And for the life of me, I couldn't uh, figure out what actually yeah. the issue was, even after reboot. Good I, I've, so it down. I've seen this happen as well. Um, sometimes the, the .lando.site aliases don't come online properly. As best I can tell, it's some, it's some like networking disconnect right. that happens when it's spinning up the containers or something. Because I notice, typically when I do a Lando start, my Wi-Fi for where, like whatever hotspot I'm on, uh, will will disconnect for a moment and then come back online. So I think it's just kind of a timing issue. Like your networking on the system goes down, and then it can't. It, you know, it's trying to validate that those URLs are are right, but it can't because you don't have a network. Yeah. Um, it's a weird kind of chicken and egg thing. But I think it's actually Docker's fault, honestly. Right. Um, right. And it just yeah. sort of a future poll and right. Yeah, and typically when that happens, if I do a Lando restart, it will fix itself. Rebuild them. Really, yeah. And that did happen to me earlier today too, and and I've seen it a few times on this laptop where actually I needed to fully reboot. It's like the net, the, the like Something. host level networking stuff goes awry and yeah. just needs a full kick in the pants. Yeah. So I'm planning to switch now from Mac to Linux. Yeah. So installing Lando on the Linux, mm -hmm. what is the process to like, uh, and do you find that you find more weird stuff on the Linux that's kind of a hard to maintain or it's pretty much running? No, if anything, uh, it seems to me like the, the Linux stuff is easier because A, you get away from the Docker for Mac problems. That's right, it's just the virtualization thing which makes it slower, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then and then like I think I think the developers of Lando are working in in a Linux environment, so I think that's their that's kind right. of yeah. default, that's right? Really, really yeah, right? yeah. So the the standard way of doing it in in Linux, you know, you make sure you get the Docker Community Edition packages from from the official sources, mm -hmm. and then you grab um, they have these uh, release packages on GitHub. So you just download the right one for your for your OS, right? In Ubuntu, it's the .deb. They have like Pac-Man ones or RPMs, um, and just install that. And like I say, for me, and maybe for you, if you're comfortable with, with Node, right? The uh, you can find that. Where's that link? The from source uh, instructions are, you know clone the repository, okay. run yarn. Okay. Right, and then like I say, when there's a new release, you do a git pull, get check out the new tag, run yarn again, and you're on the new version. Right, so it's really, that's why I say. And that's how you're installing That's how I'm doing it locally, okay. yeah. And then, you know, like I say, unless, unless you're really like, I don't want to touch node, which I was there for a while, but <laughs> this, is, this is really, really easy, like. Yeah, I'm a front end, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking for, for you, this is probably comfortable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Where's the symbol in there? For Sorry? The optionally set up a symbol in case of their demand of that. Right, right, right. Yeah, which, uh, which I, I think I've done in this case. Uh, there, yeah. This points to my, into my source oh, structure. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Yeah? yeah um, your recommendations. So right now, uh, every time you put up your computer, you probably have to CD to the drive uh, folder, uh, restart that mode. Yep. Uh, any recommendation how to have it run as a service on like, other hmm. If you want to work on the side. 
Yeah, what I'd probably do, what was the tool I did this for recently? Uh, Ubuntu has some nice, uh, it's tricky because, I mean, you could probably write like a systemd service for it, right? Um, that just does that custom thing, so on boot it would do that. I might be inclined to approach it at the user level, right, so it spins up when I log in. Um, because Ubuntu makes it easy to just add some like startup applications, and I can point it to the to the you know, front Lando start in this directory for me. It's easier than writing a system in service. That's probably what I would do there. Great. All right. Cool. Thanks again, everyone.